uh, sacred scripture, the fathers of the church, and spiritual writers all strongly recommend the examination of conscience. It is one of the most important aspects of the spiritual life. And there are two reasons for this. The first is that the examination is necessary in order to know our own faults and to make us repent of them. And secondly, it is necessary in order that we sin no more. So part of penance is, is a resolution to sin no more. So we have to know our own faults, and no one knows your own faults better than yourself. St. Jerome said, It is necessary, principally in the morning and at night, that you will do uh, to, to examine what you will do and what you have done. So you plan your day in the morning and then at night you figure out what you did. So you make resolutions in the morning to do certain things, to not do certain things, and then you see at the end how you did. Make this examination often during the day, but especially in the morning and at night, he says. St. Bonaventure said, seven times a day you should examine your conscience, considering and discussing very attentively how you have spent your hours before God. St. Ignatius of Loyola had the custom of making an examination of conscience every hour. Comparing hour to hour, day to day, week to week, month to month, to see in what he advanced and in what he had regressed. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, no one loves you more than you love yourself. And no one will judge you more accurately than yourself. Do a review the night when, uh, of the night when you awake in the morning and make resolutions in order to make good use of the day that is beginning. At night, examine yourself on the day that has passed and make good resolutions for the night that it pass in a holy manner. By using this means, you will become Almost impeccable, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. See, so this, you can see the saints are, are recommending this with great fervor uh, that you constantly examine yourself. You can think of in the hospital if you're, you, know, you see people on machines, they're, they're constantly examining the body, what it's doing, and the heart and blood pressure and the oxygen. And that's for a body that's eventually going to die anyway. So it's, it's you know, I mean, you can't go crazy, obviously, and be examining yourself constantly, but you should be aware, and we'll get into this, of your predominant fault or faults, and the movements of those faults, fault or faults, <laughs> during the day. In other words, how you typically sin every day. And you know your faults from your confessions. What your, and most people uh, confess, especially uh, in the area of venial sins, uh, confess the same things all the time because you have certain faults, you have certain tendencies of character, and vice builds on those, those tendencies of character, whether it's, it's tendency to impatience and anger, or and tendency to laziness or gluttony, or it could be anything. And so that's how you're, you're, uh, you should be conscious of those things during the day especially. 
and also be conscious of first movements. Gary Gould Lagrange says your first movement, your first thought, is, reveals your fault, not your second thought. See, so, for example, if you see someone who is uh, in some way repulsive, if you have a movement of despising that person, that's, a, that's uncharitable. You see, it's an uncharitable thought. It's one thing to say that person is in some way, say like somebody who's covered with tattoos, <laughs> that, that he is uh, something repulsive and you hope you're never like that. Or, or you know, It's not wrong to see evil or to see something wrong or to comment that something is wrong. That's not uncharitable. Charity does not require you to be false. But the despising is uncharitable. See, to have contempt for someone and to, to um, in a way, you know, uh, hate them, not strictly speaking, but I mean, you do have to hate what is evil about them. Otherwise, I mean, that, that's actually against charity not to hate. Because you have to hate evil. If you don't hate evil, you don't have love of God. But you have to, you have, to have compassion for the sinner. And remember St. Saint, Saint Francis of Assisi, there but for the grace of God go I. So when you see someone who is extremely repulsive or just a picture of evil in various ways, uh, you have to think of that, that, but for the grace of God, that, that is yourself. That's charitable. So there's a balance there. You, you can't be what we call in English, uh, it's even an American expression, Pollyanna, that was a literary <laughs> figure. Uh, who it was about a young girl who who never saw any evil in anybody. Oh, everybody's wonderful, and uh, you know, just covered over people's faults. That then that has become an adjective to be Pollyanna. You see, and and uh, charity does not require you to do that. It would be false to do that. Charity is never false, but it does require you to to have compassion on the sinner. So that, that's just an example of your first movements. Uh, you might have first movements toward anger and impatience. See, those are the things that are revealing. So that's how that examination of conscience goes on during the day. So you make sort of a mental note mm. by your first movement. You might retract it in your second movement, but your first movement was go is going to reveal a fault. or first movements of vanity. Those are very common. There's a, there's a lot. I highly recommend to you this book. It's called Particular Examine. It's very hard to get. I had it originally. Somebody borrowed it from me and never brought it back, which happens all the time. That's why I have skulls and crossbones everywhere. I've lost a lot of books. I paid about $50 for this book. It's rare, all right, but it's excellent. All right. He goes through the whole theory of particular examine and then, and the predominant fault, and then has all these questions to ask yourself. See all these questions? And some of them are very probing. <laughs> so that, it's a very, very good book. It's by a... Uh, Holy Cross Father, CSC. So I recommend, if you can find it, it's, it's excellent sermon material. Okay. So I might read you some parts of that. Uh, so, uh, so as you can see, it, it, yeah, these saints you know, are, are, cannot emphasize it more. 
Again, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, he says, the first thing that a man must do if he is seeking wisdom is to think about what he is, what is inside of him, what is above him, what is against him, what is, what is before him, what is behind him. This consideration bears fruit, namely, the contempt of self, charity for one's neighbor, the contempt of the world, and the love of God. He also says, learn how to control yourself, to order your life, to keep your habits in order, to judge yourself, and to accuse yourself to yourself. Condemn yourself often and don't acquit yourself. Let justice be the prosecutor and let your culpable conscience, which accuses you, remain standing. That's a reference to the European custom where the person accused stands in a box. It's not done in this country. But they stand in a box and they are accused. In a type of pulpit, that doesn't mean by a box. In Russia, they keep you in, in a little jail, as you're accused. Sure. In Ecclesiasticus, it says, Before judgment, examine thyself, and thou shalt find mercy in the sight of God. St. John Chrysostom, Let the mind sit down and let your thought be a judge of you, of your soul, and your conscience. Bring out all your sins in the open. Examine what you committed in your mind and impose suitable punishments for each. Say to yourself carefully, why did you dare to do this? Why did you do this or that? But if your conscience flees from these things and curiously seeks after others, in other words, what others are doing and not yourself, the sins of others, that's what he means by that, say to it, I am not a judge of others. You have not been constituted to judge others. And in this way, you will return to your own examination. If your conscience does not want to accuse you of your sins, but babbles and remains surprised, then strike it with a lash, tear it with a bloody flagellation, as if a prideful servant, corrupt with fornication, because these blows will not kill it, but will preserve it from death. Strong words. So if your conscience excuses you and acquits you, or if you fail to face your own sins, then get out the lash. That's what he says. Tear it. It's a false witness. Again, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, let us examine, let us probe, let us run through all the labyrinths and the most secret recesses, all the actions of our life and of our conscience. Let us scrutinize our ways and our inclinations. And let us not believe that we have made progress in the good because we have found some sins. But when we shall have condemned these sins by the examination, in this way, we will not have examined ourselves in vain if we recognize that we need to repeat often this examination. Every time that in the act of searching we have seen the necessity to look more, then we have searched well. If we examine our heart and our conscience every time we need it, then we would do it constantly because the enemies and the wounds are not lacking. We'll stop there today.
So we're talking about examination of conscience. More quotes from the saints. Saint Clement of Alexandria said, To know oneself is the most beautiful and the greatest of all the disciplines. For if one knows himself, he knows God. St. Augustine said, and this is a very famous quote of St. Augustine. He has a lot of famous quotes, but this one is... O God, you are always the same. May I know thee, and may I know myself. And in Latin, it's this Deus Semper Idem. Noverum te. Noverim me. May I know thee and may I know myself. Those are perfect subjunctives because that verb, like the verb to hate, is always in the past tense, even though it's translated in the present. May I know thee and may I know me. Very famous quote of St. Augustine. He also says, St. Augustine, God will come, he will show himself, he will examine, and he will convict when the change of heart will, will no longer be possible. I will place you in front of yourself, God says. Do now, therefore, what God will do later. Cease throwing behind you the sins which you don't want to look at and place them under your eyes. Come to the tribunal of your soul and be your own judge. Let fear chastise you so that the avowal of your faults take place and say to your God, I know my iniquity. My crime is always before me. That's a quote from the psalm. Place in front of you what was behind you for fear that the judge might later place you in front of yourself and you can no longer flee, that his justice sees you like a lion and that there is no one to deliver you. St. Augustine. St. Francis of Assisi said this, Who are you, Lord? Who am I? Thou art the abyss of being, of goodness, of wisdom, of virtue, of perfection and glory. I am the abyss of nothingness, evil, ignorance, vices, miseries, and of every lowliness. St. Bernard of Clairvaux. What would we do about, without St. Bernard? He always says something great. He says, be eager to know yourself because it is much better and much more praiseworthy if you know yourself than if, by neglecting yourself, you knew the course of the stars, the powers of herbs, the natures of men and of animals, and had the knowledge of all things, of earth and the heavens. Deliver yourself, therefore, to yourself. St. Ambrose says that the knowledge of oneself must precede the knowledge of God, and that one does not arrive at the knowledge of God except by the knowledge of oneself and good works. Now, there are two types of examinations, the general and the particular. The particular concentrates on one thing, your predominant fault. And the general concerns everything which you have thought, desired, said, done, or omitted during the day. So you do a general examination of conscience at the end of the day. But there should also be a particular examine, as they call it. And that is looking at that 
predominant fault. Now, you have to discover the predominant fault through your confessions, your spiritual director. That's very much a part of the spiritual life, is to know your character and also your predominant fault. And very often the predominant fault will follow the character. So, cholerics tend to have a problem with anger and impatience. Phlegmatics tend to have a problem with laziness. Uh, sanguines tend to have a problem with lust, dissipation, gluttony, and all sorts of other things. It's hard to tame a sanguine. And uh, melancholics have a tendency to um, uh, lack of charity, holding grudges, things like that. They have a tendency. Those characters are only tendencies. They are not, they do not make you robots. You know, it's like, oh, I am a choleric, therefore, I, I, you know, I, I act in a certain way. They are mere tendencies. You, see, you have to understand that some people get too excited about those characters. But your predominant fault will probably follow your character. I'll give you some, uh, this, uh, this is very good for a particular exam. That's the, so we're looking for the predominant fault. I'll give you some examples. He gives you a whole bunch of questions in here. This is, um, now he divides pride into various ways of pride. Uh, he he um, calls one the pride of superiority or authority. Uh, and then there's a pride of timidity. And then there's a pride of sensitiveness. So. A pride of complacency, which is vanity. So we'll look at vanity. <coughs> uh, am I vain in thoughts concerning spiritual affairs? In other words, am I pride, prideful about my own spiritual life? Am I vain in words in regard to spiritual affairs? So, for example, being vain about your ability to preach. Watch out for that. You know, some people preach better than others, and you have to watch out for vanity in that. Uh, am I subject to vainglory? That means, do I enjoy being praised and flattered and... Do I seek praise? These are all great questions. Do I seek the esteem of others in regard to spiritual affairs? Where, for example, you might give out advice to people through vanity. Not if you're asked or not if there's a good reason, but through vanity, See, a type of superiority. Uh, am I vain about my piety in public prayers? See, so am I... Uh, you know, some people are very, very pious, and, but they ruin their piety by staining it with vanity. They want to be seen. And they uh, usually do exaggerated things that uh, others don't do. And... and uh, um, they want to be seen in their piety. See, and there's nothing wrong with being seen. It's, it's, it's wanting to be seen. <laughs> See, so you shouldn't... Uh, it's, it's the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee was absolutely correct in everything he said. But the problem was that he was vain about it. But it's true, he, he didn't do anything wrong. He, you know, he treated everybody properly, I'm sure. But he was vain about it. Uh, 
uh, am I vain about my rule keeping? Uh, am I vain about my prompt, cheerful, generous, supernatural obedience? Am I vain about my charity? Am I vain about my mortifications of the senses, especially taste? Am I vain about any bodily mortification? Am I vain about any mental mortification? Am I vain about my avoidance of sin and imperfections? You see, vanity can get into all of these things. And it, it does, uh, it, it, it's a danger for religious and priests. <clears throat> Am I vain about my private devotions? See, that would be where you advertise them. And you do it, and it can be done in a very subtle way. But you're letting everybody know all your full set of private devotions. Has my piety made me odd? In other words, do I do odd things in my piety? I remember there was a, let's say, not, not a seminarian, but there was a man who, on the one hand, was very critical of priests, but when he prayed in church, he did this. That's how he prayed, with his back perfectly straight. But very critical of priests. Perfect example. So everybody, oh, you know, such a pious man. It draws attention. Anything that, where, that draws attention is bad. Uh, humility always wants to be forgotten and be just part of the crowd, like an ant in a big anthill. That's what humility wants. You're a nobody. Vanity is always looking for that, that, the incense from everybody else. Do I, do I love to speak about my goodness? Do I criticize the spiritual life of others? Uh, do I find fault with the way others practice virtue? Am I prone to notice faults and to speak about them? Very common in religious houses. Do I misjudge others? See, rash judgment, sign of pride. Uh, what, e what effort have I made to be humble? Do I give God credit for spiritual gifts and, and the use of them? So this is full of questions like that. So that's why this book is very good if you can find it. It's by uh, Michel Michelone. It's on, on M C E L H O N E. Particular exam. So it, it's it's a very good book for that. So. So knowing your predominant fault is very important. Gary Gu has a good chapter on the predominant fault in his Three Ages of the Spiritual Life. I think it's the first volume. It's the fault th fr from which generally others flow. and it's, 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 it's the way you're going to sin the most. So you, your examination of conscience will tell you that uh, and your confessions are, are going to tell you that where your predominant fault is. Uh, so it is necessary to do the particular examination, especially concerning those things which are closest to our heart, namely the predominant fault, the predominant temptation, because you're going to be tempted both by nature and by the devil in your weakest part. That's where you're most likely to sin. So the devil knows exactly. He knows more than the spiritual director. He knows exactly what your weak weakness is. And he's going to go for that. 
and also nature will go for it. In other words, just living life and, and the, the various stimuli that you are, are exposed to, you know, whether it's food or <laughs> could be anything. Our habits, you see, you have to, habit is a, a, an acquired uh, ability to do something easily. So again, piano playing, if you have practiced on the piano for 100 years, you know you have that ability to sit down and play. It's easy. A sign of habit is that it, the act is easy. A sign of not having the habit is that it's difficult. Right, so you have habits of sins. Those are vices. So you have to look at your habits. Things that you do with such ease. Neglect of certain duties or uh, talking about yourself. Talking too much. So you have to examine all of your habits. And principally the bad ones, obviously. You might have some good habits. But you have to look at your bad habits. Again, those will come out in confession, but they also need to be done in the, the uh, examination of conscience. <clears throat> You're going to see a habit by certain sins, and you have to be able to diagnose yourself. That's why you take ascetical and mystical theology to diagnose yourself uh, you know where your where your predominant fault is, and where you you have these habits of vice. Those habits of vice must be destroyed. And uh, the also the virtue which you lack the most. Patience, fortitude. So when the head of an army is killed, the army is dispersed. And so when the dominant fault is eliminated, the other faults are also conquered. And in order to kill a snake, you cut off its head. You don't go for the body, you go for the head. So also with faults. And David killed Goliath by aiming for his head. Because that shot that he, that he put to his head only made him pass out. Then he came over with his sword and cut off his head. One big head. And in order to kill weeds, you go for the root. So also with the predominant fault. That's the end of examination of conscience. And we'll stop there.